very renowned Dr. Carl Rossi. If you could hold your questions until after his presentation, we'd appreciate it so that he can get through this and then he will address you or address your questions after the presentation and answer anything that you would like. Uh, you have his uh, scripts information uh, that I've given to everybody there, and so you can review that. Uh, tonight, his subject is IMPT, or Intensity Modulated Proton Beam Therapy of Prostate Cancer. Dr. Rossi was born right here in California, actually right here in Orange County in Anaheim, California. He attended Claremont McKenna College in Claremont, California, and received his BA cum laude in biology. He earned his medical degree at Loyola University in Illinois. He then did his medical internship and radiation oncology residency at Loma Linda University Medical Center, of course, in Loma Linda, California. Dr. Rossi served in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps for 18 years, both active duty and reserve duty, then retired as a Naval Lieutenant Commander. Dr. Rossi has made over 55 presentations to professional groups all over the world. And I wish that I had the time to go into where he's been all over the world and the professional people that he's uh, instructed. He's done professional groups in Italy, Switzerland, all over Europe, all over the United States. 55 of them that I counted, and, and that was, I'm sure there's more now, because that was just up through 2013, I think. Obviously, I can't mention them all, but they were all prestigious medical groups. In 2011, U.S. News & World Report awarded Dr. Rossi the top doctor award in radiation oncology. Dr. Rossi has had many media appearances, including Television interview quoted radiation therapy for prostate cancer on KVCV TV, Victorville, California. A newspaper interview, Proton Beams Battle Prostate Cancer. Sounds like a science fiction movie. In, San Bernard, in the San Bernardino Sun, page one. He had a television interview, Bloodless Surgery, ABC TV 2020 feature. He did proton beam therapy of prostate cancer, US Today, USA Today interview. Proton beam therapy of prostate cancer, AP review. Proton beam therapy of prostate cancer, ABC television review. Proton beam therapy of prostate cancer, CBS radio interview. Prostate cancer, Fox News interview. Prostate Cancer, KVCR-TV, Interview with Bueller Collins. The results of the PROG 9509 Dose Escalation Phase Three Randomized Trial Press Conference at ASCO, ASCO Prostate, Prostate Cancer Symposium, is one of the most prestigious conferences on cancer in the world. More recently, Dr. Rossi was guest presenter at the PCRI annual conference, I think two years ago, and they did a couple of years, didn't you? And then you did the mid-year conference this, this year? Actually, it was last September. Last September, right. So he's a very, very busy professional man and has very many, many credits under his belt. In addition to his busy professional life, he makes time for community service. From 1998 to present, he has been a volunteer assistant track and cross country co coach at Claremont Mud Scripps College. From 2007 to present, he's been a volunteer pilot for the Redlands Police Department Aviation Support Group. When I first met Dr. Rossi, I came to his office for consultation on proton therapy for my personal battle with prostate cancer. 
on his wall above his desk was a picture of a cockpit of a 747-400. I knew when I saw that, that was the plane I flew as captain for five years for United Airlines. I knew that I was in good hands. It's with great pleasure that the Prostate Forum of Orange County present to you Dr. Carl Rossi. Thank you all, and let me see if I can get this to back to where it needs to be without managing to kick the presentation right back where it doesn't need to be. Now, normally when the doctors come here, I have them set up so they're ready to go before we get going. I don't know what happened. Right, it was set up. It, it just, was set it, up. It, it went back to its screensaver. Again, thank you for coming. If I'm not speaking loudly enough, please let me know. I'm. I do have this tendency to talk relatively loudly, but I also tend to go accelerate, which is not the best thing when you're trying to discuss a technical subject. What I want to do in the next, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, is give you a flavor of what proton therapy is and really what it isn't. And to let you understand how it fits into the many, many weapons that we have to treat, in this case, prostate cancer, but we use it for any of a number of diagnoses and also give a little history on it because if you don't understand how it evolved and, and believe me a lot of physicians do not understand what it's about or how it evolved it's difficult to understand why we like to use it as a radiation therapy weapon so that's why I have this slide saying that if you don't understand the basics of it which I will teach you you don't really have a good grasp of what we're doing this is not magic it, the, the ability of protons to stop in a particular location was discovered way back I think it was in 1903, so over 100 years ago. And if we had discovered them at the time we discovered x-ray therapy, I think we would be, have been using this for a heck of a lot longer than x-rays because they let you spare normal tissue. And that's what determines what you can and cannot do. What keeps me and keeps other radiation oncologists from giving the dose you want to give to the cancer isn't the dose you want to give to the cancer. We could give that an infinite dose if we could get away with it. It's what will the rectum tolerate? What will the bladder tolerate? What will the spinal cord tolerate if I'm treating up in the chest for something? That's what makes me pull my punch. So as a consequence, if you look at all of our different technological advances in radiation therapy, whether it's protons, IMRT, seed implant, you name it, they've all really been designed to try to do one thing, and that is a better and better and better job of sparing normal tissue. The less radiation you give to the good stuff, the more you can give to the bad stuff. And while we often sit around in meetings and argue about, well, what's the safe radiation dose? Because we know we get away with a lot of stuff in radiation therapy. There's only one dose that everybody agrees on that's absolutely safe, and that's a big fat zero. So if you look at all of our technology, we're trying it which is some way to get closer to that zero point. Now, we're not going to ever get there completely, but the closer you can get, the better. If you remember one thing from me going on for the next 20, 30 minutes, it's this about protons. They stop. If you think about x-ray therapy, when we do x-ray therapy of a cancer, what we're using are higher power versions of the same x-rays that we use to take x-ray pictures, right? So, you know, you have a chest x-ray, you're standing here, the tube is behind you, and the the film or whatever, that's kind of quaint film, but the image device we use now to capture it, it's in front of you. That beam goes all the way through you. When I treat a patient with x-rays, the same thing happens. So as a consequence, we inevitably treat a lot of normal tissue, and we have these clever ways of trying to spread that dose around, but you're treating stuff that doesn't need to be treated. When you shoot protons into anything, whether it's a person or the wall or air, the beam will come to an abrupt stop at some point because effectively it runs out of steam, it runs out of momentum. Those little charged particles just come to rest. And they'll stop in a few millimeters. You'll go from 100% dose to zero in two to three, maybe five millimeters. So beyond that point, there's no dose. And I think you can just, if you consider that for a second, you can see there's some obvious advantages to that. That spinal cord's behind the, the tumor in the chest, guess what? The beam stops before it ever hits it. We're treating a breast cancer patient, don't want to treat her heart, we're able to stop the beam at the chest wall. And if you look at a comparison, if you compare a typical proton plan to a typical high technology x-ray plan, 
you're going to treat three to four times less normal tissue. Same dose to the target, same dose to the cancer, but a substantially lower total radiation dose to the patient. And again, we argue clinically about whether that's relevant, but I can't think of any situation, and there really aren't any in radiotherapy, where giving more radiation to the normal tissue or giving any radiation to the normal tissue will not cause some harm on some level. This is the guy who made it possible, not a physician, a physicist named Robert Wilson. If you want to read about a fascinating individual, write his name down and we can look at them on Wikipedia. Dr. Wilson, among his other many achievements, was the youngest section head at Los Alamos during the Second World War. He was running the Oak Ridge National Laboratory at the advanced age of 29. His job was to separate U-235 from U-238 and get the uranium for little boy. So he does that, the war is, war is over. A year after the war is over, July 1946, he publishes a paper in a journal called Radiology, and this paper says, in essence, protons would be a great way to treat cancer because they stop. If we could just figure out where to stop them, that's the hard part. You know, it's like a lot of things in science, the idea is there, the technology has to catch up to it. So he has this idea, that's one of his, that was one of his brain children as well, that's a little boy, the world's first combat atomic bomb that he got the uranium for. And this little bit about him, you know, he was born literally in a town called Frontier, Wyoming in 1912. After he, the war, he goes back to Cornell, that's where he had most of his academic career. And in the mid-70s, he becomes the founding director of what is now the United States Department of Energy's premier physics laboratory, research lab, one of the world's biggest physics labs, Fermilab, outside of Chicago. He designed the headquarters building, Wilson Hall. He has a number of sculptures that are several tons that he are on the campus there that he did. And they have a buffalo here on the lab symbol because Dr. Wilson insisted that since this was a prairie site they were building the lab, you should have prairie animals on it, what existed here in the 1820s, 1830s. So he somehow talked Uncle Sam into buying him a buffalo herd, and it's out there to this day. If you ever go out there, it's a very beautiful 50,000 acre site. It's about uh, 25, 30 miles west of Chicago. Russ, you probably remember flying over the, you could see the ring once or twice when you're on the approach like to, to nine left or nine right. You can see the buffalo herds roaming around. And he and his wife are actually buried in this little cemetery at Fermilab. But anyway, the idea dates back to 1946, so almost 70 years ago. It took about 10 years to try doing it. And this is from the Harvard Cyclotron Lab in the mid-1950s. They took a machine that was never designed to treat people and they did these kind of lash-ups to treat brain tumors. And does it look like Frankenstein's lab? Yeah, it was the best they could do though. This is 30 years before anybody had a place that was built to do this on people, not a physics lab that somebody jury-rigged. And they did a lot of work there. From 1957 to 2001, they treated at the Harvard Cyclotron several thousand patients, including about 200 prostate patients. But it wasn't ideal. It was trying to do surgery in this church. If it was an emergency, well, a surgeon could do it, but you don't want to do it every day. You want an operating room. So what had to come about, and this is where Loma Linda gets in the picture, was a proton facility that was designed literally from the ground up to treat people, not as somebody's laboratory that we you know, tinkered with to treat people. We, Dr. James Slater, who got this built, his idea from the mid-1960s was, let's take proton therapy, move it out of the physics lab, and put it where the doctors are. So you can treat not one person a day or two a day, you can treat a couple hundred a day. And take advantage of the fact you have this weapon as a nice beam profile it stops and use it on a large scale. So if you guys have been there, I know some of you have, you have one accelerator in the corner of the building and we have multiple treatment rooms that it serves. This is the model that all existing proton centers have followed to this day, including the one that I work at at Scripps now. We have 18 operating proton centers in the U.S., up from one in 1990, and they are all laid out like this. Now, there are a couple different ways to do proton treatment, but most proton therapy to date has used what's called passive scattering, which is kind of a funny term, passive. What you're doing is you're taking a beam of protons and you run it through a bunch of patient-specific devices to shape it, to shape it in X and Y, and to shape the depth. And you end up with this uniform dose that covers the target and then comes to a stop beyond the target. And that works just fine. There have been, again, probably 95% of the patients treated with protons to date in the world have been treated with this method. 
but there's some problems with it. For one thing, you can't get specific within the target. If you want to spare something in here, you can't do it. You have to give a uniform dose. What we have at Scripps, what the newer proton centers are deploying, is what's called pencil beam scanning or intensity modulated proton therapy. What you do, you take this little beam of protons and you don't have physical devices to shape it. You shape it with electromagnets. The, the best analogy I can give you is if you've seen the way a 3D printer works, and you build up a solid object layer by layer by layer, that's what I'm doing with radiation. I, I, I'm putting in proton radiation through my target in one millimeter thick layers. I can make them higher dose, lower dose, you name it. With passive scatter, we have these, these are the devices that we use to shape the bead. It works, but it's a mature and technology that's kind of hit a dead end at this point. It's going to be supplanted, I believe, by pencil beam treatment. And I've got a couple things in here about, a little more about passive scatter that I really don't want to, you know, belabor, but it has some drawbacks to it, including trying to treat big fields. If I've got to treat a patient whose pelvic lymph nodes need treatment, it's difficult to do that with a passive scatter system because you can't get a field that big. So for those patients at Loma Linda, we treat that part with x-rays. I don't have that limitation anymore because I can treat the same size field now with my pencil beam system that I can with an x-ray system. So I want to show you a little animation of how this works. This is a, actually an animation of one of our gantry treatment rooms at Scripps. Let me see if I can get to play without advancing it to the next slide. Oh, yeah, I'm going to just cheat and do it this way. So you have here, this is a lung cancer patient, but the same principle applies for prostate cancer. We have a robotic table to position the individuals. And before we start our treatment, we have to make sure we're on target. Remember, that beam stops in a few millimeters. If you're off target, you're not doing the body a big favor. So we take a series of images. We have what's called a cone beam CT. We also take regular orthogonal x-rays to check our position. And then we adjust this table. Our table can move in about one-tenth of a millimeter increments in six, six degrees of freedom. So this is analogous to I'm going to go hunting. I want to sight my rifle in. I've locked it in the bench rest. I put a few shots on paper. Now I've adjusted the screws. And now we're going to fire for effect. And we will see here in a second with this animation is how the dose is delivered. So this is a lung tumor. Like most tumors, it's not a perfect sphere. Wouldn't that be nice? But they never are. You know, it's got an irregular shape. And we just paint the dose in layer by layer by layer. For the typical prostate uh, gentleman, it takes about 25 seconds to deliver the dose to the gland. And, the, and usually it's in 17 or 18 layers. So it's very fast. But that's how you do it. You build up the dose, and it does not have to be uniform. I'm going to show you some examples in a bit in prostate cancer where I'm able to actually boost the radiation dose to any identifiable intraprostatic disease. No worry, I won't make you watch every last slide, but that gives you a picture of how it's done. Okay. So I wanted to, you know, a couple of stats on prostate cancer. This is, doesn't project that well. It's already old. We all know there are a lot of cases out there. This is data from 2013. There were nearly 240,000 cases in the U.S. And despite the fact that it's the cancer that some people say you don't need to treat, there were almost 30,000 deaths in the country from it. We know that there are patients who don't need treatment that we treat. The problem is trying to pick them out well in advance and being able to predict the future behavior of their disease based upon perhaps a, a biopsy sample, which may not reflect the entire milieu of the tumor. That's what makes it tough when you recommend active surveillance. You, have to, you can't just say, go away and never come back. It's we have to check you regularly. We have to biopsy you. We have to do these things to try to get a better picture of what's really going on inside that prostate gland and we're placing a lot of faith in what we're pulling out on our needle biopsies. I mentioned a few minutes ago that Harvard treated a couple hundred patients with protons. They started treating uh, prostate cancer. They started treating prostate cancer in 1977. So I was a sophomore at El Medina High School when this began. And the idea was they were treating guys who had very advanced disease. They, they thought, we've got this precious modality. We can't treat that many patients. We're treating a couple a day. Let's treat the worst of the worst. Let's treat those who have T stage, stage T3 or T4 disease, the ones we know that with x-ray therapy, especially the x-ray therapy of 1977, they couldn't do as well. So they treated 30 patients and said, yeah, we could do it. We used protons just as a boost. We didn't do the entire treatment of protons, but we showed that we could do it in safety. We showed that it has had a you know, favorable toxicity profile, and that was published in 1979. Thank you. Much better. 
And as a consequence, they then went ahead and did a bigger trial. That took, as you're going to see here, a very long time to do. So in the course of the next 13 years, 13 years, they had a randomized trial where they said, half of you guys with this advanced disease are going to get x-rays alone, half are going to get x-rays and a proton boost. It took a heck of a long time to accrue 200 patients because they could only treat a few people a day. And they published the results of this back in 1995. And in essence, what they said was, for these folks with really advanced disease, their cure rate was no different because they tended to fail in other parts of the body. But the ability to control the cancer in the prostate was greater in the guys who got the higher dose because they were able to get a higher dose with using protons to boost them in relative safety. At Loma Linda, when we first started, we looked at over 1,200 gentlemen that we treated in about a three or four year time period just to see how we're doing. Are we getting results that are similar or better to Harvard? And this was using radiation doses, which at the time, you know, back in the early 1990s, 74 to 75 gray was big stuff. The typical dose was 68 gray. That's all passe now, but at that time we thought we were you know, being pretty bold. And we followed these folks for five, six years, and what we found is that across the board about using, using PSA as a measure of success, you know, PSA-based definitions, we were seeing about 73%, 75% were free of their cancer in 10 years. Not bad, we've gotten better, but we did this to show that we were getting the same outcome that the folks at Harvard had published, and equally importantly, when we looked at what we quaintly call morbidity in radiation therapy or in medicine, that means side effects. It's kind of a bad term, but that's what it means. What we worry about in side effects are these, what we call grade three, grade four. Those are the showstoppers. What's a grade four morbidity if you're treating prostate cancer with radiation? That's a guy who ends up with a colostomy. A grade five is a death directly related to your treatment. So grade three is I need surgery, perhaps a, a more, a not quite as extensive as a colostomy, but something significant has to be done. When you start seeing these numbers get up around 5%, that's when you pretty much stop your treatment and say, we've got to think about this a little more, maybe change what we do. So you can see our incidence was well under 1%, despite the fact we were giving higher radiation doses at that time than most of the rest of the world could do. So then we went ahead and did this randomized trial that we did with, was between Loma Linda and Mass General. And what we said is, we think we can give higher doses of protons and safety. We think higher doses are better. We want to prove it by doing a study where we literally assigned gentlemen at random to either getting a standard dose of radiation, which was 7,000 rad, or 7,920, and we'll do all this dose escalation by using more a greater component of proton in their care. And that was our, our hypothesis. This is the way it broke down. We had just under 400 guys. Half got the standard dose. Half got what we call, considered to be the experimental or investigational dose. And we watched them over the years, and this has been going on now for 15 plus years. What we found is what we expected to find, two important things. First was that, let me, let me show you a couple pictures of the way we actually had to do this. This was the way they had to do their proton boost at Mass General. They were having to direct the beam between the legs because the machine they were using at that time was this old cyclotron, the old Harvard cyclotron. They couldn't get to the prostate through lateral, which is better in terms of sparing the rectum. That's how they had to treat their patients. Nobody would do this anymore. We don't need to. But back in the 90s, that was the best they could do. And at Loma Linda, we used our typical left and right lateral field to boost the prostate. But the important thing we found was that in every instance, whether they had low risk disease, intermediate risk, or high risk, higher radiation doses were more likely to put, let that person be free of their cancer 10 years out than giving the standard dose. So what you see here, this is a freedom from biochemical failure using what's called the Phoenix definition that I think many of you are familiar with. The dashed line are the guys that got the higher dose, the solid line are the ones that got the standard dose. These curves separate and they stay separated. So if you got the higher dose on this trial, you're far more likely to be free of your prostate cancer 10 years out than if you got the standard dose. We still cure you know, a lot of the standard dose patients, but which arm would you prefer to be in? I'm thinking, you know, nobody's going to vote for here. We want to have everybody up here. And when we looked at the low risk patients, this group that does really well with, you know, people said, oh, they do so well, dose escalation isn't necessary. We found out, well, yeah, it was. The high dose patients, freedom from relapse at 10 years was 
Standard dose, it was down in the mid-70s. Again, that's not bad, that's better. And probably equally importantly, we found that we could give these high doses and we didn't hurt people more. Other people have done this with x-rays, and they've come to the same conclusion that higher doses are better. But the problem they run into is usually injury to the rectum. We didn't find that. In fact, when we looked at our morbidity, it was the same in both arms. So we've done some other comparisons using this data. We wanted to see, well, how do protons stack up with brachytherapy? Because brachytherapy is a very darn good way of treating prostate cancer. Nothing wrong with it. So we looked at patients that were treated on the high-dose arm of our study, and we compared them to patients who were treated at Mass General with implants done by one person, Anthony Zeitman. And what we found is that the curves overlie. That they did well either way. Brachytherapy, high-dose proton radiation, no significant difference in the outcome out at 10 years. University of Florida has done a number of studies that they've published recently that have looked at uh, different doses and different stages of prostate cancer. And I don't want to dig too much into this in the interest of time. But in essence, what they found is that if you look down the bottom here, their incidence of grade three complications is extremely low. And I can tell you their cure rates are as good as anything else out there because they're giving radiation doses as high, if not higher, that we did in that study at Loma Linda. We've also looked back at Loma Linda at giving the treatment over a shorter time period, taking an eight-week treatment course and compressing it into four weeks. And again, not to belabor it, we did a study of 60 patients of this, and what we found is that in terms of outcome, it was the same as if we did the treatment over a longer time period. And if you look at the incidence of these grade three complications, it's a whopping zero. So we could give that higher dose in a shorter time period and not hurt people. So currently, there's a lot of work going on around the country in protons. This is just a, a I went to clinicaltrials.gov a few months ago and typed in proton treatment of cancer. How many clinical trials? Over 100. So when you hear people say there are no, no research going on in protons, maybe you should ask them if they looked at clinicaltrials.gov lately. There were 15 or 16 prostate trials looking at higher doses, altered fractionation, chemotherapy plus proton radiation, et cetera. It's a very significant area of research, and when you consider that right now we're up to a whopping total of 18 proton centers, and there are over 100 trials going on, the degree of involvement in clinical research in the proton world is big. That's far, for a far greater percentage than what you have in the extra world. So people are we're trying, we're trying to get the data to optimize our therapy, and I mention this again because you often hear, and I think it's voiced without any, any background, that protons are not being researched. They're being researched quite heavily. And speaking of research, you also often hear, well, there's no randomized data. There's no, you know, coin flip, you get, get radi x-rays versus protons. In medicine, we have these things called levels of evidence. We talk, we look at studies and we try to figure out, is this a really good study? Is this a not so good study? And if you are familiar with the NCCN guidelines, and I bet a lot of you are, they have all these different categories of what they, what they give recommendations. And that's, as in they say, if the, Data is really solid and there's uniform consensus out there, it's a category one. And if it's not quite as solid or the consensus isn't as great, you have these other categories two and category three. And everybody likes to think that in adult oncology, this is all we're doing. That all of our recommendations are based on this category one stuff, the most uniform consensus, highest level of evidence possible out there. What you find out is the opposite. This was a paper that came out about three years ago where this clinician just went and looked at the NCCN guidelines for the 10 major cancer types and said, let me look at the recommendations that are made and let me see how many percentage in each of those cancer types are category one, category two, category three. And what he concluded was that we're doing the best in breast cancer. A whopping 11% of the recommendations, actually Bellin was a little better, but for common cancer, 11% of those recommendations were category one. The majority were category two and category three. In prostate, it was about 5%. So when people say to you there's no randomized data on, say, protons versus x-rays, you can tell them you're right, but there's not a lot of randomized data on most of the things we do in prostate cancer or in breast cancer, lung, colorectal, you name it, you name it, you name it. And again, I mention this because I often hear this complaint at meetings that people think that everything we do has to be done in a randomized fashion. It doesn't. We can learn a lot from things that aren't coin flips. And in fact, most of what we do every day in clinical oncology is not based on studies that were founded on the principle we have to flip a coin, and heads you get treatment A, tails you get treatment B. And again, I worked, I touched on this earlier. 
very, very little of what we do is based on this level one evidence. In fact, the vast majority of what we do is not based on that. So when you're talking about radiotherapy trials, remember, there's no advantage to treating healthy tissue. There's nothing to be gained by it. We just want to try to see how much of a clinical gain we can get by sparing it. You've never had a situation in radiation oncology where sparing normal tissue has been detrimental to the individual. We know it's toxic. We already know that radiation's a bad thing. So there are attempts to do a randomized trial of protons versus IMRT. This is a study that opened in 2012. It was open at Mass General. There have now been a few other institutions that have joined it. The idea is to try to look at toxicity differences. The problem has been getting people to agree to enroll in it. Because you're telling a patient who wants to enroll in this trial, look, we've got two different arms. One uses protons, one uses x-rays. Either arm, you're going to get the same radiation dose to your prostate. So as far as your cancer is concerned, it's going to have the same impact. The difference is, if the coin flip says heads and you go to IMRT, you're going to get a lot more what we euphemistically call low to moderate dose radiation to your pelvis than with protons. We know that's not a good thing. We're just trying to see if we can get away with it. Would you like to sign up? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I'm not kidding. And this is why the, this is about six months old now, but the goal was 400 patients, and they've got about 50 patients that have re agreed to this. And many of these patients are agreeing to it because they're being told by their insurance carrier, if you want proton therapy, you must be on a randomized trial. And there's a 50-50 chance you won't get it. But that's just, to, you know, again, to give you a flavor of how difficult it is to do some of these studies when you're not... There's no potential benefit to the patient. It's not that we're going to give 20% more radiation with protons and maybe have a clinical gain. We're trying to quantify how much detriment we cause by giving a dose bath to the pelvis. Some of you may have seen this paper that came out a couple years ago saying protons were more toxic than x-rays. It was based upon a survey of a Medicare database. And again, I don't want to dig into it too much, but the gentleman who did this from North Carolina just did a survey of Medicare patients who'd gotten proton therapy all of whom were treated at one institution, by the by, and looked to see how many of them had billing codes after their radiation where they went to the GI doctor. Didn't know why they went to the GI doctor, didn't know what the, you know, what, was it because they had a hemorrhoid, was it because they had you know, you know, diarrhea, just said, well, they had proton radiation, they went to the GI doctor, we're going to assume it's because they had radiation-induced rectal bleeding. And his conclusion was that he saw the same rate of this as you saw in the x-ray patients. The, you know, if he had called us to ask, by the way, well, our, our institutional routine was that anybody who has any complaints of GI bleeding gets referred to gastroenterology. If it's a hemorrhoid, we would send them to GI. So that's a built-in bias. But this got a lot of press because they said there was no difference in, in toxicity. It kind of flies in the face of a lot of other data from, say, from Florida and from a paper that I had published with uh, Ian Talcott back about five years ago where we surveyed the patients who we treated. We mailed them questionnaires and said, what are your side effects? Taking the physician out of it. And we found that the side effects were very, very, very minimal. I want to skip through a little bit of this. I want to get to the end of this and have some time for questions. A little bit about our facility, and, and I'll give some examples of, of IMPT uh, planning for prostate cancer. You know, I'm fortunate in that at the time Scripps was built and completed, it was the only U.S. center that was could only treat with pencil beam scanning. This is the newer technology. The second one just opened, that's Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And a third one will be opening up at University of Maryland by the end of the year. Most new centers under construction have deployed this technology. Many of the older ones are trying to retrofit it. The way the building is laid out is that we have our everything on the, all the patient care areas are on the first floor with uh, physics up on the second floor. We have a, a clinic here. We have our imaging building where we have CT, CT, PET, and MRI. So we can do all of our own imaging for patient planning and for diagnosis there. Then you have the treatment area, which is this big block here in the back. The building is 102,000 square feet. The site's about eight acres. So, you know, these are not things that you're going to shovel into a 20 by 30 enclosure. And we're lucky that we have a lot of land down there. We have five treatment rooms. So, layout like Loma Linda with one more room, three gantries, two fixed beam rooms, and they're all served by this one superconducting cyclotron. That's a very typical layout for a modern proton center. You have one accelerator that serves all these rooms. The cyclotron itself, the one that we use because it's superconducting, is relatively small. It's only about three meters in diameter. It weighs in at a about 95 tons. That's it. And you're accelerating protons to about 60% of the speed of light to treat people. That's the velocity you need to penetrate to the appropriate depth. This is a picture of it being gently lowered into the building. The cyclotron 
is supplied by a company called Varian, which is the world's biggest manufacturer of x-ray therapy equipment. They build their cyclotrons in North Germany for their proton facilities. So this machine was built outside of Cologne, and it was put on a ship, brought through the Panama Canal. They delivered it, God, I don't know why, we're in San Diego, they delivered it to Port Juanini, Ventura County, and over the course of two days, they trucked it, two nights actually, not days, they trucked it down the 405 freeway on this 22 axle trailer it delivered to the site, and this was October 28th of 2011 when they actually placed it. That's a picture I took a couple weeks ago just looking at the front of the building. I, I spent 20 years in the basement, right? Loma Linda's buried in the basement because it was built with the intention of constructing the children's hospital on top of it, which they did. So having window, whoops, having windows, oh, there's some windows. Having windows is nice. I don't have to look out, you know, it's not, it's not always the same inside. I can see the daylight, I can see night. This is just a picture of the atrium for, you know, with the main entrance here. And give you an idea that like most of these facilities, they're trying, to, they're trying to build these so they don't look like a bunker, right? And you're already scared enough coming into this place. The last thing you want to do is make it look like something right out of the Cold War. So we've, the architect, I think, did a very good job of you know, a lot of windows and a lot of light in the patient care areas. This is a picture of actually one of the gantry rooms. You saw an animation of this earlier. This is not a prostate patient, as you can tell. It's a head and neck, our primary CNS patient. And with these tables of the six degrees of freedom, you could come in at whatever angle you want. So a lot of times, we'll, for not so much for prostate, but for other things we treat, we'll use an oblique angle, some type of funny angle to spare some normal tissue. We do a lot of pediatric treatment there. About 10% of our patient load are kids. And as a consequence, since about 40% of those kids need to be treated under general anesthesia, we have our own three bed anesthesia recovery and induction unit that's right across from a couple of the treatment rooms. Our pediatric patients are treated in conjunction with Rady Children's Hospital, which is the biggest children's hospital in California. They're based in San Diego as well. So a couple of plan examples. Um, one of the things you can do with a pencil beam is you can use much tighter margins than you have to do with passive scatter. And when I was treating a Loma Linda and the way they still do it, you would have a margin around the prostate of about 12 millimeters because the beam edges were a little fuzzy. With a pencil beam having a sharp edge, you can reduce that margin down to about three millimeters so you're treating even less normal tissue. So typical prescription, yeah, I come in with left and right lateral beams. I'm using a rectal balloon still, sorry, but we're doing some other things beyond that. And you build the dose up around the target very, very nice conformal treatment with minimal dose, you know, some entrance dose, but no dose in the anterior or the posterior structures. We'll give you a little closer view looking at three different projections. This is a person cut in half this way. You can see high dose here, a lower dose away from the gland, and the dose becomes zero. And we do these things called dose volume histogram analysis to, to compare plans and see how much normal tissue is being treated. What you want to see for your bad stuff is a curve like this, but you get 100% of the dose to 100% of the target. And these opposite curves, this is a curve for rectal wall and bladder, where the dose to the rectal wall and bladder, the dose getting, the volume getting the same dose as the target is extremely low, it's usually less than 5%. Now, if you do a comparison of a high, a IMPT plan to very high technology x-ray plan, VMAT stands for Volumetric Arc Radiation Therapy Using X-rays. Again, either plan can give you a very nice high dose area to the prostate. The difference is this dose back. Remember, this is an x-ray plan on the right. You have x-ray beams coming in and going out. So you get low to moderate doses throughout the pelvis. And if, I think if you look here on this lower picture, the proton plan, you can see we're building up the dose around the prostate. Here we're treating the pelvic lymph nodes. Those are presacral nodes. If you try that with VMAT, you get dose from skin to skin. So that's the difference. There's no difference here, same dose to the target, but there's a difference in the dose to normal tissue. I am able to, because I have this ability to differentiate my radiation dose, we using the pencil beam, I'm able to give higher doses within the prostate to areas that contain what we call a DIL or dominant intraprostatic lesion. So everybody I treat, I do an MRI on in their treatment position as well as a CAT scan because you can't see these on CT, you can on MRI. And like in this case, this gentleman had a dominant lesion here in the left peripheral zone near the left neurovascular bundle. So I define that as a subtarget. And I tell the planning computer, well, I'm giving two gray a day to this entire area. I want this to get 2.3 gray a day. I want to give it a higher dose without escalating the dose to the entire gland and the rest of the rectum. It's something you can do with a pencil beam system that you cannot do with passive scatter. So if you look at a CAT scan, that, that area looks the same as the rest of the prostate, but the MRI lets you map it on for the CAT scan and then target it. And that's exactly what I did. So 
You've got 100% dose. This is the 100% dose line wrapping around the entire prostate gland. This is getting about 115% dose per day without increasing the dose to the rectal wall because I can just concentrate that higher dose in that small area. And looking from the side, you see the same thing on DVHs where we're showing that we're able to get an even higher dose of that lesion, 100% coverage of that dominant lesion without increasing the dose to the normal tissues. More advanced disease, this is a gentleman who has a significant amount of cancer here on the right side of the prostate. Remember, from a, on a CT or MR, you're looking from the feet up. That's the right side. This is actually, it looks like there's some extra capsular extension there. I mapped that as a sub-target and did the same thing. As far as the treatment plan, we, I boosted the dose to this irregular area while I was still treating the prostate. And you get a nice and positive plan like that. I could also treat pelvic lymph nodes, which I couldn't do with the passive scatter system. So this is a three-field plan treating the pelvic nodes in a patient with locally advanced prostate cancer, sparing the bladder and sparing some of the anterior tissue. Because you're just stopping the bead before it goes far immediately. And looking from the side, same thing. Here's the lymph nodes in front of the sacrum being treated. Here's the prostate being treated. You're stopping the dose at this point. This is all small bowel. It's not getting radiated. These guys don't get diarrhea when you treat them because there is no dose up here. We have some special situations like patients who are post-prostatectomy. Um, you treat them for the same reason you treat with x-rays. You're trying to back clean up after the surgeon's been there, but you're trying to do this with protons to spare normal tissue. You give the same dose prescription you would with x-rays. You cover the same area. You just treat less normal tissue. A fair number of guys that have unilateral hip replacements. That's usually not a problem. I just don't treat through that hip. Bilateral hips are a whole different kettle of fish. They're very difficult to plan sometimes. But with a unilateral, instead of using left and right lateral beam, this is a gentleman where I was using a beam from the contralateral side and a posterior beam and building up the dose here and not having to treat through the steel there on the left side. We have some patients, and this is an area of protons that have particular benefit. They have uh, problems with their intestines that are really absolute contraindications to x-ray therapy like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So if you can stop the beam before it hits the intestine, you won't hurt it. One of the first patients I treated at Scripps was not a prostate patient. It was a woman with lymphoma of her abdomen. And she had a lymphoma involving her left kidney. She had Crohn's disease. She could not get radiation with x-rays. You would have kicked her Crohn's all the way off. I treated her with a posterior proton beam. The radiation dose of her intestine was zero. She had no side effects from it. So I, I'm a couple things, and I'm just going we'll to we'll kind of finish and get out this up. Uh, Cato the Elder. Nothing to do with radiation therapy. I was kind of screwing around when I made this slide. Protons, Delinda S. Protons must be destroyed. This is a slide I like to show when I'm giving talks to residents. Cato was this Roman guy who, um, I'll, I'll morph him into Anthony Zeitman, who, I, my, kind of, who I've written a lot of papers with, but Anthony and I have different opinions on proton therapy. Cato was a Roman senator who would finish every one of his speeches in the Roman Senate saying, Cartago Delendo est. Carthage must be destroyed, because he thought Carthage was an existential threat to the Roman state. He'd be talking about the price of oranges in the forum, and he'd say, oh, by the way, I think Carthage should be destroyed. <laughs> Sometimes you get this, I get this feeling, and maybe it's because I, I feel like I'm being picked on a little bit in other rad hoc meetings, that that's the attitude. So it shouldn't be. This is a tool. It's just a tool. The nice thing about it is it lets you do some cool things that you can't do with x-rays. Does it mean x-ray therapy is obsolete totally? Not yet. The hope is at some point in the future that we can get the cost of this treatment down. That's the, that's the killer. If we can get the cost of the treatment down to the payers to where there's no difference to them, they're writing the same check whether you're using protons or x-rays, they could care less. Believe me, I've had enough conversations with medical directors over the last three years to know that. I've been told on a number of occasions, if this didn't cost any more, we wouldn't care. We don't like paying more for something that we're not sure is any better. They're defining better in terms of cure. When you argue, well, I'm treating less normal tissue, and that's the same reason that we developed IMRT, because it treats less normal tissue, they say, oh yeah, that may be the case. We want to see that proved in a randomized trial. And this leads to absurdities. Uh, most, probably the craziest one I've been involved in was in Washington State, where we were trying to treat a breast cancer patient from Washington State. She needed to have radiation of her breast and her mediastinum, because she had lymph node involvement. And we wanted to treat her with protons because we didn't want to treat her heart. And there's lots of published data in the last three or four years showing that x-ray therapy of breast cancer 
because you use these tangential beams, can harm the heart in certain cases. In fact, it's a greater, the, the, the risk to health and well-being from heart disease is greater than the cancer coming back. It's, it was published in the New England Journal about 2013. So we showed this comparative plan to some state agency up there where if you treat this lady with x-rays, you treat her heart, and if you treat her with protons, you wouldn't. And the response I got was, can you prove to me that not treating her heart will not hurt it? I'm not kidding you. That was a response I had. <laughs> can you prove that not treating your heart will not cause a radiation injury? I'm like, you've got to be, cre you've got to be kidding me. I, I said something that wasn't quite as polite as that, but that was the response I got. It's just a tool. Insur insurers are looking at cure rates, are not looking at side effects, in part because they have a significant turnover of their patient population over relatively short time periods. But in order to take all that off the table, to get rid of that argument, the thing you've got to do is reduce the cost of the treatment to the point where it's competitive with other modalities, because then these arguments will stop. And how are we doing that? Well, for one thing, it's like any other technology, right? Your cell phone today is a heck of a lot more capable and probably a lot less expensive or has more capability for the same price than it did 10, 15 years ago, you know, laptops, you name it. I, up until about 2000, you could not buy proton machines. When Loma Linda went to build their machine, Dr. James Slater had to get Robert Wilson involved because Fermilab built the accelerator. Nobody would build it. He had to get the Department of Energy to write a $20 million check with our taxpayer money to build that machine. Now there are eight different commercial companies who supply this equipment. Varian, Hitachi, Sumitomo, IBA. So you have competition in the marketplace. You're getting newer designs, cheaper machines. Our facility was $210 million. That ain't cheap. It's cost of a 47, actually a triple seven now, or an eight seven, but a lot of money. There are designs out there now for one or two room centers that are in the 30 to $40 million range. So still not cheap, but cheaper. Anyway, that's where I see this as heading. I don't want to you know, bother going on. I think I've, I've bound, panged on this drum enough. It's just a tool. It's a darn good tool. And now with the pencil beam system, we have the ability to use it on the common things beyond prostate cancer, like breast, lung, that we didn't have at the earlier system. So we can start to use this on even more common malignancies and exploit that advantage in terms of not treating normal tissue. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to try to answer questions and go from there. Yes, sir. First of all, Sure. You had a long trip from San Diego right. to get here. We, we all appreciate you being here and, and uh, presenting an excellent presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one of the questions is, you talked to, you compared Proton uh, with IMRT. How would Proton compare to SBRT CyberKnife? Sure. Okay, Let me answer, I'll answer that one first. So the question is, how does Proton compare to SBRT with a, a CyberKnife approach? You can do SBRT with Protons. Uh, and we have, we are, the, the only thing that's holding us back from doing it now is not the technology, it's the billing code. What I mean by that is if you look at what are called the CPT codes, the codes that you have to use to define a procedure and get reimbursed for it, the CPT codes for SBRT specify two modalities, either X-rays or gamma rays. They don't specify charged particles yet. That's going to change in about a year or about less. So that's the only reason that we haven't done it in the body. But you potentially, would, you could do this, and you'd have the same advantages of a beam that stops that over, over x-ray therapy, which is CyberKnife as an x-ray therapy-based modality. The, there is a study that, that is being done at the Proton facility in Chicago that's run by Northwestern University where they have, it's a randomized trial, but they're randomizing prostate patients between standard treatment with protons, 44 fractions for them, versus five treatments with protons. So the identical regimen that you'd use with CyberKnife. Because we're trying to answer that question, and is, is SBRT really as good? We're trying to answer that in a scientific fashion. But there's no reason you can't do it. You, you will spare more normal tissue, because CyberKnife is still x-ray. You've got lots of beams going in this way. You've got low doses coming out the other end. And with CyberKnife, you're, you can't approach from the posterior because you can't treat through the table. So you're somewhat limited in your, in your arcs of what you can do. One of the uh, advantages of SBRT. Could you define that? What sure. SBRT? SBR, yeah, thank you. S SBRT stands for Stereotactic Body Radiation Therapy. The idea is that you take. Um, 
You treat, you want to treat a particular target. This has been used primarily in prostate and in lung and in brain metastasis. And by focusing a number of beams on that target using stereoscopic guidance, X-ray guidance to guide your beam, you give a very high dose of radiation. So for SBRT of prostate cancer, it's typically done in five treatments. So it's one week, maybe a week and a half, that you give five big doses, usually of eight gray per, excuse me, per fraction, times five. And you're using these very, very fine guidance techniques to make sure you're on target because you only got five shots at it. So for some things like lung cancer, early lung cancer, it's very clear that SBRT of lung tumors in what's called stage T1 or T2 disease is every bit as good as surgery in terms of curing those patients with, with less with fewer complications. It's used in prostate cancer is a little bit more controversial just because we, we're not 100% sure yet that five fractions of eight gray is equivalent to say 40 fractions of two gray. And if you look at say, the NCCN guidelines for 2015, they say we think that modest hypofractionation going from say eight weeks to four weeks is every bit as good as long-term treat, long, longer treatment courses. But we're not sure yet about cybernite because about, about the about five fraction treatment with whatever modality because we don't have long enough data on it. But the intent is we treat you, you five treatments, you're done, you're out of here. In the short run when you do this, you tend to create more urinary issues during and immediately after treatment because you're really hitting the prostate hard. But there isn't any reason you cannot do it with charged particles. Uh, in fact, if you go look back 50 years when the first stereotactic treatments of brain tumors were done, before the gamma knife was invented, they used helium ions. Second question. So, so uh, I'm still on the first. Oh, okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, so with CyberKnife, okay, one of the things that they advertise is that they're able to make to adjust yep. the movement yep. so many times, okay, prior to the actual attenuation of the radiation. Yep. So comparing that to proton, is there any is there any uh, parity there? Uh, terms of, of it having the capability of doing that. Yeah. So it, with CyberKnife, what you typically do, because the CyberKnife treatments can take 25, 30 minutes. You've got all these different directions you have to treat. The CyberKnife is a linear accelerator. It's on this articulated arm. And you can image the patient while you're treating them, because they're using an x-ray beam to treat. And that x-ray beam is coming out the other side. And they're getting a picture of what they're treating. And it will actually track the target in real time. You can see this thing moving a little bit as it treats. You have to do that because the beam on time is so long. It's 20, 30 minutes. What we end up doing instead, you know, our, my beam on time is 20 seconds, and if I were to do an eight gray treatment, it wouldn't be much longer than that. So what we do instead, we don't, first of all, we can't image the patient in real time because the beam doesn't come out the other end of the individual. So I don't have that luxury, I also don't have that detriment. What we do instead is we fix the prostate in position with the balloon. And we did studies both at Loma Linda and at University of Pennsylvania and showed that with that balloon in place, the prostate motion is on the order of about two millimeters, hence a three to five millimeter margin is sufficient. So with the balloon, you're, 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 you're trying to hold the prostate gland yep. in a steady position. Yep. Okay. Correct. The other thing, I, I kind of alluded to this during the talk about something beyond the balloon. There is a, a recently approved material by the FDA called Space OAR. It's also known as hydrogel. It's a gel that can be injected into the space between the, what well, becomes a space, between the prostate and the rectum. It lasts about three to six months. And it opens up a space of about 15 millimeters. And I have my first patient that I'm treating with this now. And you know, for us, 15 millimeters is as big as a barn door. So he doesn't need a balloon, because I'm not worried. I, I, put a little, I put two extra millimeters of margin posteriorly. All I'm doing is radiating more gel. So you're gel. trying to pr protect the rectum? Yeah, that. yeah, and he's, I've been, I, he's, he's, he's the first one. I, I, I do a, a repeat CT and MR on him every week to look at the stability of his treatment. And it, the, the plan is just beautiful. So that's another way to try to get around that, well, what if the gland is moving a bit? If you put something there to protect the most critical structure, right. then motion doesn't become quite as critical. Last question, sure. thank you. Uh, with the pencil beam, when, when it's attenuated to the target area, can you bend the beam or is it just linear? With, with the pencil beam, when we attenuate it, can we bend it or is it linear? It's a raster scan. 
Let's say that again. It's a raster scan. Okay. Just like a, like your, at least what we currently do is you scan it back and forth for each layer, okay. like you're building a picture on a TV tube. Okay. But that's the way we do it now. There's some other things coming down the pike where as the software improves, we can scan it as a contour. We can scan it in any shape you want. So how far is that down the pike? It's being used at the Paul Schreer Institute, which is a Swiss national physics lab. That has, they're the people who developed pencil beam scanning in the early 2000s. And Varian um, is, insists that we'll have the capability within about 24 months. It's a software upgrade. Okay. The nice thing about these systems is that the hardware is pretty, you know, the hardware lasts forever. The cyclotron's got a 30 year guarantee on it. It's what you can do with the software that runs the magnets that lets you do these upgrades. But yeah, we're, what we're doing right now is the simplest way to, to do pencil beam Later. scanning. And that's not going to be the way we do it down the road. Thank you. For your sure, time. sure. You bet. Let's turn back. I uh, stepped out from the Oh, how dare you? <laughs> what is the uh, cost for a pencil the, beam therapy? The cost for pencil beam therapy, uh, let's say I were to do 40 fractions, and I'm looking at a Medi say, Medicare reimbursement for that. Between the professional and the technical, it's probably about forty-five to fifty thousand dollars. It's about twice on the technical side what a similar course of X-ray therapy would be using high-technology X-ray. There's no difference on the professional side, but there's a difference on the technical side. So Medicare reimburses currently around a thousand dollars per treatment with protons. For IMRT, it's about five hundred, five sixty-five. And then commercial payers, is just whatever the con you, you have contracts that give you different rates. Because what if you don't, you know, like I go on to Kaiser? What do you do then? So what if I go down to Scripps? How much will it cost me? What we, bottom line. Yeah, what we do for the U.S., the, the non-international patients who are self-pay, we typically charge the Medicare rate. So, so $45,000, $50,000, yeah. If, if we do this as a standard fractionation, one of the things I'm able to do, because it's been proven that you can, in many patients, you can shorten the treatment course if they have low risk disease. I'm able to go from 40 treatments to say 20 to 28. That, if you go to, from 40 to 20, you literally have cut the price in half. In fact, we've had some situations where it costs us less to deliver proton treatment than it does for a patient to get IMRT. If you look at just the Medicare reimbursement. But yeah, that's typically what we do for US patients is we, we use the Medicare proton rates as our basis for charging. So you don't have different rates. In other words, I remember when I talked to Will Melinda about it, I found out that it was going to cost me more because I guess because I, they were going to charge me the Medicare rates. Yeah, I mean, every, every proton center is different in, the, in that regard. Uh, I've, I've heard, if you look at, I don't know about adults, but if you look at pediatrics, they're, they're, the, some of the prices I've seen quoted, say, from UPenn for treating their, their pediatric patients, international patients, they're two or three times what we're charging. And I have one last sure. question. You mentioned in your talk, I thought, that there was a study that showed that the seeds were just as effective yep. as the proton. Yeah, Could yeah. Explain that? I certainly can. Um, brachy, first of all, seed implants, brachytherapy, it's yet another way to put the dose where you want it and not put it where you don't want it. And I think if it's done by a, an expert like a Peter Grimm or a John Sylvester, it's as good as anything else out there in terms of cure. The difficulty is that not everybody's a candidate for it. So one of the questions that came up after we published the results of, our, of the PROG study was, well, how does this compare to brachytherapy? Do those patients, have, let's say you take the same patient group and do a seed implant. Do they do any better or worse? So what we did is we looked at about 60 patients that had their implants done at Mass General by Anthony Zeitman, so all by the same person, and we compared their outcome over time in terms of cure, biochemical freedom from relapse, to the patients who got treated with protons on the high dose arm of the trial, and there was no difference. So and we weren't surprised by that. We kind of expected that. It wasn't better, it wasn't worse in terms of cure. They're both very good treatments. There are pros and cons to each. The, the biggest downside to an implant um, Again, it's, it's a technical procedure. There are people who are better at it in some than others. And there are much stricter criteria for who is a candidate for an implant. The gland has to be a certain size range, and yeah, that's, which is a 20 to 60 cc's. And you also can't have the gland hiding behind the cubic arch and a few other things. But if it can be done, it's, it's a very, very, very good option. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Sure. <clears throat> I'm a brother of a balloon. 
Okay. I think I know the gentleman who started that from once upon a time. Yeah. So, See him every now and then. Now, um, what they did is I had a, basically a not even a pen used before. And I had six cores, but the uh, point is, is one core was totally full. Mm -hmm. And the other one has a seminal nerve. Uh, okay. Uh, prior to them giving radiation therapy, they did an image. This is back in the moment, uh -huh. about three years ago. They did an image. They didn't uh, do a, uh, at that time, probably a C11 choline. Yeah. Uh, so they didn't know, but it was already outside of my prostate. They treated me, okay, and, uh, or before that, they did not give me uh, any hormone. Did they discuss it as no. an option? No. Okay. They didn't give me any hormones prior to it, and there are studies now that say if they, okay. if they give it for two months beforehand, you can actually reduce the mortality by 40% over a seven year period. So I, I think that had they done that, that alone would have helped me. Uh, and then after you do your uh, radiation, had your image first, and then, and then the hormones, which shrinks everything down, which gives you a smaller target, yep. and then at the same time, uh, image again afterwards to see if it's still gotten out. In other words, uh, if it's feasible at a you know, half, mm -hmm. a millimeter, half a uh, centimeter. But uh, I don't hear that being done. I mean, uh, all three, you know, those three actions. Yeah. Image first, give you one month, treatment for two months, and then image again to see, because if, if it's already out, it's a whole different form of treatment. Yeah, that's right. The, I, I, you know, you hate to... Um, Excuse me, Dr. Yeah. Rossi. Did you hear him in the back? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, 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 thank you. The, the, and you know, so, so if I'm not describing it correctly, step in. Gentleman was treated, but prior to treatment, even though there was some evidence on biopsy that seminal vesicle was involved, there was there weren't any imaging studies done or other studies done to try to delineate the extent of the disease, whether or not pelvic lymph nodes were involved, whether or not the neurovascular bundle was involved, etc. So the radiation I'm suspecting was directed just at the prostate. In addition, um, despite the fact this appeared to be stage T3 based on seminal vesicle involvement, there was not hormonal manipulation done prior to treatment. For num a number of gentlemen who have higher risk prostate cancer, it's been relatively standard now for at least the last half decade that in order to improve their chances of success, you treat them with a course of hormone suppression. You, you're, you want to stop their testosterone production that begins prior to starting radiation and continues on during and after radiation for some time. What this does is it kills some of the cancer cells outright. And some of the ones it doesn't kill, it makes them more radiosensitive. They're less able to repair radiation injury. So that's why, it, depending on whose paper you look at and depending on the stage and the grade of the cancer, you can see anywhere from about a 10% to, you know, I've seen 20, 25% reported improvement in freedom from relapse over time. So none of that was done. You mentioned choline 11, which is a, a, a nuclear medicine test. It's a PET scan that uses a radioactive isotope. It's a radioactive form of an amino acid, choline. It's an excellent study. The only problem with it is the darn half-life of the isotope is so short, it's about 10 to 15 minutes, that the places that can do the study have to have their own cyclotron on site to produce it. So I send my patients to Fabio Amito, I think some of you are familiar with, yeah, over in Phoenix, good guy. Yeah, um, I think that I've gotten, since it's, mostly because I have the tools, uh, I'm able to do MRIs on everybody, and I do that on everybody, unless there's some reason I can't, like they've got a, a, a defibrillator or some other reason. That's the only reason I won't do it. Because MRI, you saw from that example I showed, it shows you with much greater detail what's going on in and around the prostate gland. On CT, it's just this homogeneous density, you can't tell. So I do an MR, diagnostic MR is part of my planning on everyone, and we have that overread by a diagnostic radiologist. And it's not that unusual for me to get a call or get an email saying, I think I see a node, I think I see extra capsular extension, you gotta correlate that clinically, and then you change your plan. It's, it's exactly what you do. I've also had some patients I've seen that Fabio has sent me in the last about the year and a half where they had prior radiation and they may or may not have had pelvic lymph node radiation as part of their treatment, but they have what looks like an isolated recurrence in a pelvic lymph node or a retroperitoneal node, and we go after it. 
And is that more likely to cure that person? We don't know, but we can do it with, I can do it with minimal morbidity. So I've had about half a dozen cases that he sent me because you can, you can do this with the pencil beam. You can just get in there and treat these small areas. You do it with IMRT too, but you're gonna treat more normal tissue. Yeah. And so you say they did the whole layer. And this is just the sixteen to seven notes. But again, for those three things that I mentioned, this seems to be just standard. Yeah, I agree. I, one of the reasons that they, they at least when I was there, and I've been there for you know a couple of years, but I don't think it's changed that much, that one of the reasons that they weren't doing MRIs on the prostate patient at Loma Linda is that we couldn't put that pod through the scanner. You know, the patients are treated in this full body pod that's got a lot of metallic elements in it. Yeah, you, can't, you can't put that in MRI. So you could scan them outside of it, but then you'd have to mat try to match up the anatomy when they're not in the pod with the way they are in a pod. It's, it's possible, but it's pretty difficult to do it. Yeah. yeah. So you have to, you know, I've, I've got the luxury of, of, I'm not using the full body pod, I don't need to. We've got a different immobilization system. And I've also got an MRI, I'm dedicated MRI scanner five meters away from my CAT scanner, so you go right from one to the other. But yeah, it, it, needless to say, the more information that you can develop, in general, the better the plan you're gonna make. And with imaging, you know, if you're looking at the prostate, looking at the pelvis, the MR is hard to beat. I'm hoping that we get, there, there's under development, some choline 11-like test, but not using that choline 11, using some other isotopes that are more readily available so that we can start to use those more routinely. And I've got a PET scanner sitting on, sitting next to the MRI as well. But it helps you target. So it's, it's only gonna lead to a more accurate treatment, definitely. Sure. Wow. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Hi, I was treated in Loma Linda, about, uh, had a PSA of uh, 11, and uh, that's when uh, Dr. Rossi was over there. I'm in perfect shape. That was 15 years ago. Uh, I have no side effects, nothing at all. And I, I'm just playing. I need to get to see you right away just to keep up. Yeah. But I have I don't even have a urologist. I never had one uh, after, you know, after the treatment. And uh, I just think that if anybody is, needs treatment for anything, they should forget about everything else and go see Dr. Rossi. Can I ask you a question? Uh, sure. How much did he pay you to say that? Yeah, right. <laughs> I should pay him. Th thankfully, I'm not, first of all, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thankfully, I'm not the only guy in the world right. who treats prostate cancer. Yeah. Or I'd never go home. Yeah. I, I yeah. do have one question. Sure. Uh, last year at the PCRI, uh, Dr. Zeitman was there, mm -hmm. and he seemed to, I mean, I was amazed at his presentation where he seemed to say uh, proton and uh, yeah. other methods were about the same. Yeah. And I mean, I was just uh, flabbergasted. <laughs> And, you know, well, it's not by coincidence that I morphed Cato the Elder into Anthony Zeitman on a couple slides back. Yeah. Anthony is, you know, he and I have, we've written a lot of papers together. We're kind of our equivalents at our, at our old institutions, but we have- yeah, I, I did read his papers when I was at Loma Linda yeah. when I was getting treated, yeah. so I know. Yeah. It's just, he has yeah. a different opinion. I, I think yeah. he's looking at it from the standpoint of only of cure. And I think, again, if you look at, if you get 8,000 rad with protons, you get 8,000 rad equivalent with the seed implant, you get 8,000 rad with IMRT. The cancer cells, all they care about is like I hit with 8,000 rad, they die. And Anthony is of the opinion that in adults, the sparing normal tissue isn't as important, which I think is wrong. And he's actually in the minority in his department there. If you, there, there was a nice paper that came, must have been a lot of fun when they refereed this in their department when it, about four or five years ago. You've got Herman Soup, who was the former chairman, saying there's no benefit to treating normal tissue ever. And you had a gentleman, a couple other, their staff, Tom Delaney, a few others saying, there's no benefit to treating normal tissue. And Anthony's saying, oh no, it doesn't matter. It, it has to matter at some level. I can understand this, well, we don't know clinically, it doesn't matter to everyone. Look, we treat lots and lots of folks with x-rays every year. We don't kill most of them. Most of them do pretty darn well. But if you didn't have to treat that tissue, you shouldn't. I, I, I had this, the first time I ever had this discussion with Anthony was, when I, about 1994, when I said to him, 
I want to start treating my post-prostatectomy patients with protons. And he said, why do you want to do that? And I said, why should I treat their whole bladder? And he kind of stops and said, oh yeah, that's right, you don't need to. You don't. It's just, it's, it, he, I think philosophically he's more of the mind that prostate cancer shouldn't be treated at all. The, he gave a talk at UC San Diego about six weeks ago that I was at, and that was the thrust of it, was that we should be doing what the UK is doing, which is not treating a lot of it. You know, the United Kingdom has just um, bought two proton centers from Barry that, because they've gotten tired of sending their kids over uh, offshore to the US. So they're going to build two facilities like ours, like we're going to have their physicians as guests for a long time because they're going to be training at our place. And they're making a lot of noise saying, well, we're not going to use this for prostate cancer, which to me is a big mistake on a lot of levels. For one thing, you know, it kills, still kills a lot of people, right? The other is, when you're uh, pioneering a new technology, and, uh, and pencil beam scanning is a new technology, who do you want to do it on first? Do you want to take the most complex possible case and try it? Hey, let's see if it works. Or do you want to try it on something where it's straightforward treatment plan, a couple eames, you've got two critical structures, not six or eight or ten like you have around the base of the skull, and you've got a biochemical marker that can tell you years ahead of waiting for imaging studies to change whether your treatment has worked or not. I don't have it in this presentation, but I've got a couple pictures of, you know, the, uh, using, using IMPT of prostate cancer as analogous to the X15 was, you know, a vehicle that was used eventually. I took a lot of that data and used it to, to calculate how to build the space shuttle. That was the only data they had on a hypersonic vehicle coming through the atmosphere. You take, you learn on the simple things and go to complexity. Uh, Anthony's a puzzle to many people. Bob Marchini, you know, he and, he and Anthony, he, he, you know, Bob lives back there in Boston. He, he calls me up about twice a year and says, I don't get Anthony. I said, neither do I. <laughs> it's, it's just the way he is. It's just the way he is. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that treating, not treating publication. Yep. Green does have it from the side. Yep. Are there any cases of public or yeah. Um No, I mean, there, it, it's... I, I had a slide that I kind of blew through it, but University of Florida did a very nice analysis of the instance of hip fracture using passive scatter protons and compared that to similar age patients who had not had radiation. They found that the risk was the same. It's, it's under 1%. It's well under 1%. It's not zero. And yeah, if you look at those dose profiles, I'm putting dose into normal tissue. I don't like doing that. I, I, if I could avoid that entirely, I would. I can't. My beam is better, but it's not that good. But that has not been an issue. The other thing is we're not seeing... Um, Florida has also published on this. There's no reduction in testosterone production because there's no scattered dose of the testicle, and there's a, a less bone marrow suppression because you're not treating as much of the pelvic marrow. Why do this versus brachy? Yeah, well, um, brachy therapy is a perfectly acceptable treatment for prostate cancer. The biggest, there are a couple of differences. For one thing, the brachy therapy requires a certain size prostate gland. So there's a significant number of gentlemen who are not candidates for it. They have median lobe hypertrophy. The gland is too big or too small, and you can't do a good implant. That's far less of a concern with this. Uh, quick example. Typically, the largest size gland you want to implant is about 60 cc's. The largest gland I've treated to date was 363 cc's. Unfortunately, that was all cancer, but you can get an idea of how much larger volume you can treat. The other thing with brachytherapy is that there is a difference in the side effect profile. With brachytherapy, during the implant, and usually for several weeks thereafter, there are more urinary obstructive symptoms than with either protons or IMRT because you've really hit the gland hard and you've poked 20 odd holes in it. And in the long run, there's a slightly higher incidence of urinary bother than with protons or IMRT. Conversely, if you look at passive scatter protons and brachytherapy, and look at the instance of rectal bleeding, it's lower with brachy. So it's a trade-off. But it's individual choice. And you know, it's the same as saying, well, you could have a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. You get the same outcome. It's the individual's choice as to what they want to do. Yes, sir. What, what about sexual dysfunction with proton therapy? Oh, it never happens. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be nice? You think, you think I'd need a bigger parking lot if I could do that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's common. It's common. It, whatever you do, I, I don't think it's any, from what I've seen, you know, both in the patients I've treated and in looking at the literature on this, and I think the best 
information I've seen comparing protons and IMRT and brachytherapy was from UCSF. We all seem to have about the same risk of creating problems with erectile function because no matter what you do, you're going to get dosed to the neurovascular bundles. You have to. Where I'm hoping to see a difference, and this is a hope, I haven't proven it yet, it's a hope. With pencil beam, I mentioned I'm able to put higher doses in areas, I mentioned I'm able to spare things. I can't spare the neurovascular bundles very well because they're right against my target, but the MRI lets me outline the penile bulb. And the dose of the penile bulb in some but not all papers is indicative of the risk of erectile dysfunction from radiotherapy. So I carve that out as a structure, as an avoidance structure. But if you just ask, you know, across the board, if you want a number for having, a, let's say you go through radiotherapy of any type, what's your chance of having some change in erectile function a year after treatment? Any change, about 40%. It's pretty significant. You start parsing that down, you get all sorts of, you find all sorts of other interesting things. Age makes it, certainly plays a role. Hormonal therapy, yes or no, obviously plays a role. What's the social situation? What other medical issues are there? Well, you're diabetic, guess what? That doesn't help the matter one bit. So it's very common though. I think that another way of looking at it is that radiotherapy in general is about the same as, as about as good as nerve sparing prostatectomy, exclusive of what Pat Walsh published, you know, which nobody else can reproduce. It's about the same. It's about 40%, 50% chance of having a problem afterward. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. After 15 years, my parts are still working, so. Well, that's, I mean, just as only one yeah, person. Yeah, you're, they're going to think I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, really. Your karma. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it, it is, it, people get, you know, it, you get away with it. It just, it just depends. I, if you could spare the neurovascular bundle completely, that would be great. And that's why some people are looking at this idea of, well, let's just treat part of the gland. You know, if you do cryo, you may want to just freeze one area and so do the same with the nerve spring prostatectomy. That's being done with brachytherapy as well in selected individuals. And we've looked at, you know, I, 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 I haven't done it in a real person yet, but I've modeled it, I can do it. I'm just not quite ready to do it yet. Where you just do partial gland. I, well, I take that back. I have done it on one guy who is a physician from Georgia who had MRI guided ablation times two, it didn't work. MRI guided laser ablation. And he was very concerned about maintaining his erectile function. So I just, re, I just treated the area of the effect where they charred and outside of it. And I tried to spare the contralateral side. So I'll see if it works. I'm a Kaiser patient as well. What is uh, square one and coming down to? Sure. You know, um, how do I begin? Getting on the five and hitting. <laughs> the, yeah, you don't have to be referred. Um, what's what's going to happen is you, you may or may not be able to get a referral from your Kaiser or PCP to come down for a consult, which would be nice if you could because then they would, you know, they they would cover for the cost of the consult. Mm -hmm. You can come down on your own. They're gonna when you come in, they're gonna tell you. You know, they're gonna well before you come in, they're gonna tell you these are the the typical charges for a consultation. It's usually I don't know about four hundred bucks something like that. Mm -hmm. As far as getting treated, that's where the fun really begins. Kaiser does send us patients, but not prostate patients. We treated. We've already treated some of their kids because they can't do this. We've had a couple of patients with chordomas, base of skull tumors, they've sent to us for the same reason. But for prostate, they look at it kind of like Anthony does, says, ah, x-ray therapy works just as well. So they will reject it. I had the same problem at Loma Linda. So what a lot of my Kaiser patients did there and also down at Scripps is if they can, if they're old enough, they will disenroll, get on Medicare, which has been covering this since 1991, at least in California, and they will get treated. They'll have to pick up a supplemental insurance because that'll pick up what Medicare doesn't pick up. And then if they want to, when they're done with treatment, they'll often go back and enroll with Kaiser again. So it's, it's, a work, it's an interesting workaround. You know, it's not the cheapest workaround in the world either, but that's what people have done. It's probably cheaper than writing a check you know, and, and paying for it entirely out of your own funds. Sure, sure. Thank you. Sure, welcome. I think I've talked to you guys to death, so I'm going to be very quiet. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.